You can go ahead and take a seat. I am thrilled to introduce uh, one of our, our speaker today, not one of, he is the speaker, <laughs> um, Jeff Phillips. Why don't we give him a warm welcome? Thank you. Jeff is a pastor, a friend, he's a church planter. He works with one of our nonprofit organizations that our church supports called Ibero American Ministries. And a lot of the work that we've gotten to do has been particularly in Chile with them, but they're actually all around the world. They're a global organization, so I can't wait to hear what he has to share with us. Thank you so much, Jeff. Okay. Thank you so much. It's so great to be back. Um, Sorry, Scott's not here. I, I've heard he's uh, already on his sabbatical, but I'm very honored to be able to be here and, and to share. And my passion is about being missional people. This is what we're going to talk about today. And, and, and in my case, becoming a missional person, I went to Chile for a two-year commitment. I have now been there 45 years. Uh, <laughs> I have four children and nine grandchildren, all born in Chile. And so this has allowed me to think about a whole process of how, how in the world did a, did a young man, because I left when I was 21 years old to Chile, uh, become a missional person that travels around the world and gets to experience the things that I, I do experience. So first of all, I have a question. How many of you have passports? Okay. Raise your hands, please. Okay, we're ready to go. <laughs> you guys are in good shape. You guys are in good shape. And that's one of the, the things. I, I, I seriously speak in some churches where maybe 20% have passports. And so uh, obviously you're a mobile community, which is an encouragement. Uh, usually what we think next to be missional people is we need like $100,000. We just need a pile of money. And that's how we are going to be missional people. Well, when we went uh, to Chile, it was the day after our first wedding anniversary. Literally, we were packing our bags on our anniversary. And we left this country with $300 a month pledged and a one-way ticket. So it wasn't about piles of money. <laughs> it was about obedience. It was about responding to a call that the Father had given to us. And so, it, it, believe me, finances is, is the least important when it comes to being missional people. Uh, there's a saying that out there that says, get out of your comfort zone. And, the, and that's a, a, a good uh, sentence to use, get out of your comfort zone, uh, but I would like to challenge you to think of something even different. Expand your comfort zone. I think that's a much better goal. Not, not, not to like be in a new country, I'm expanding my culture zone, and this is horrible. No. How do you learn to be comfortable in so many different countries? I've been in in 40 different countries now. I just got back from Iraq two days ago. I just love those people. I just move among those people. Uh, several of them are called my, my Kurdish grandchildren because I just have a relationship with, ship with them and, and love them so much. Obviously, Chile, I've spent two thirds of my life in Chile, so that that is actually uh, where I feel most comfortable. 90% of my sermons have been in Spanish. Uh, Jericho said, uh, I heard you pause a couple of times. You went into Spanish, right? In my mind, I did. And so I had to come back into, into English. But again, I, I think one of the things that helped me understand what mission on old people is all about is the, the church I came out of in Portland, Oregon. Now, my definition of a good youth pastor is he's always in trouble with the eldership. <laughs> Just because he was doing all kinds of crazy things all of the time. And so he got this idea um, back in the 70s. Portland, Oregon, downtown, became one of the major porn industries in, in that country. And so he had this great idea of taking all of the youth down to the major porn building where they sell, because back then you couldn't get it online. You had to go and pick it up in a magazine. And he said, let's just go down and pray. 
in front of this building. And I thought, that, that's an incredible idea. I'd only been a believer a, a year. Everybody had to get permission from their parents. Not everyone got permission from their parents. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> this was a, a tough area. I think I probably deceived my parents, saying we were going on an outing. I think that's what I said. So we got down there, and we lined up at both sides. It was on a corner, and, and the youth just lined up on both sides, and it was so cool. You'd, you'd watch these uh, people walk up to the, the porn shop, and they'd look up, and they'd see all these kids praying, and they just turned around. <laughs> Not one person entered that porn shop an entire day, so we were just rejoicing. And, and as we were along the walls, there was this... Uh, man coming down the street and he was big and and I said to him God loves you and he goes oh yeah how do you know and I said the Bible says so and he goes show me and I went I'll, I'll get someone and he grabbed me he goes you show me and I went oh okay well I did know John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And he looked at me and went, not bad. And I noticed he had been drinking. And so as he walked away, I said something to him. And to this day, I can't remember what it is. And, and he came at me and I went, this guy's going to hit me. And so I just kind of backed up close to the back wall and I'm looking at my friends, you know, like, and everybody was in twilight zone. There were, no one saw anything. And he came up to me and hit me with his chest against the wall. And I went, oh, man, I'm going, this is not good. And he started at me again. And I, I was seriously inside of me going, God, this is not fair. I've only been a believer one year. Kill one of these other people. <laughs> they, they've been in the church all their life. I want to stick around a while, okay? Okay. And again, they saw nothing, and he, he came up to me, and I went, here it goes. I'm coming. And uh, I just put my hands down, and he got right up to me, and he goes, and walks away. And I just kind of sank down on the ground, and then my friends come to life. Jeff, what happened? Oh, Jeff, what happened? Where were you when this guy was going to kill me? And so then we go back to church, and the people that weren't allowed to go had, had stayed to pray. And, and they had done a list praying 15 minutes at a time. And they said, Jeff, do you remember at what time it was? And I go, yeah, like I'm going to forget. And I said it was 4 o'clock. And they looked at each other and got really quiet. And they handed me the prayer list. And at 4 o'clock was my name. And they had begun to pray. And so I, I began to understand how the Father is and how he works with those who walk in obedience, who want to be missional people, who want to walk in obedience. And, just, and, and there have been those processes along my life. And so I, I just want to challenge you with one thought. To become a world Christian, eh, you have to become a local Christian first. You have to be able to... Com eh, to impact your community and what is taking place uh, in your community. It, you don't just jump from one or the other. Now you can, but it, what I've discovered is it has to take place in your local communities, how you're impacting your communities. What is the most frequently repeated command in the Bible? Do you know? I heard it from several. Do not fear. Of all the commands in the world, obviously our Heavenly Father knew that this was something that was going to affect our lives. This was something that was going to either cause us to just freeze and not move forward or to be able to get past those fears and, and, and make a difference. I remember I came out of a tough life. I, I came out of alcoholic parents. I won't, I won't go into my past, but I remember there was a missionary woman who came on a Saturday, Sunday night uh, in Portland, Oregon, and she talked about her work around the world and then said, I'm going to pray because I believe there are young people that want to give their lives to world missions. 
and let's pray. And seriously, I thought this. Man, I wish I hadn't had such a screwed up life. Man, I wish I could have been with some of them. So we bowed and, you know, and, and began to pray. And she asked people to raise their hand. And I'm kind of looking at all the people that grew up in church. And nobody raised their hands, you know. And the prayer was over. And I was going like, dudes, you're the ones. What are you waiting for? And she goes, somebody here is being called. I'm going to pray again. Bow your heads. And I bowed my head and all of a sudden I went, oh, no. And, and I went, I, you know me, Father. You know my past. Look at all these other people so far ahead of me. And I said this really spiritual prayer. I said, okay, I'll go if you promise nobody will laugh at me. I literally thought they would laugh. But obviously they did not, and I went forward and received hugs and prayers and laying on of hands and went to, went to Bible college. And so fear is something that just challenges each and every one of us. Let's look at what Isaiah says here. Isaiah 41 says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Our Father knows the fears. Uh, Jericho just talked about, man, with what took place this week in Texas. I mean, that's, that's something that could either completely stop us or it can completely motivate us to do something about this and to show compassion and to bring solution to what is happening in our, our country. John 4, 1 John, I'm sorry, yeah, 1 John 4.18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. I just got back from Iraq. Uh, we took a medical team from Living Word in Pennsylvania, and we were in refugee camps. And we ministered and gave health to over a 1,000 people. We had a dental clinic that met with those. And, and we had these incredible uh, translators because we, we needed the doctors to be able to speak Arabic, even though we're in northern Iraq, which speaks Kurdish. But because so many refugees have come into that part of the country, uh, we were using translators. By the end of those 10 days, these translators well-educated college-age kids were just weeping over the love that they saw from the medical team from the United States, it's the compassion that was shown, because they're used to be treated like dirt. Any physical, any medical needs, are they're just treated so badly. And so these people were impacted by the lack of fear and the abundance of love that was given, which I think is so, so important. Let's look at this next statement. It says, let's make no mistake about it. Until you learn to live without fear, you won't find it easy to follow Jesus. If you live in fear, every time you are called to something that is challenging, you might just stay stuck. I just know so many people that are dominated by fear instead of moving in faith and obedience. Some people say to me after I speak, because I've just been in a lot of crazy places, some really weird situations, Jeff, you are so brave. And I thank them, but I actually think, I don't want to be known as brave. Extreme sports is brave. Those guys are crazy. I mean, what they do. I want to be known as faithful. I want to be known as obedient because that's how you move when fear tries to move in and dominate you. You move in a result of faith and obedience. The safest place in the world is in God's will. I'm not saying the easiest place in the world is in God's will. Because when we're in God's will, we are challenged continually 
we come into situations that we would never believe. In 2003, we took a Chilean team into Iraq. We were in Jordan, ready to fly into Baghdad. And I saw the television the night before. And it said a DHL plane was hit by a missile uh, trying to land. And they have said, the next flight that comes in, we will take out. We were the next flight. And to this day, I don't know why I didn't say, let's just wait a couple of days and let them take someone else out. (laughs) But it was a faith issue. And I think by our honoring our commitment, because I said, anybody who wants to go home, blessings. You will not be judged. Everyone decided to go. So when we got to the airport, everyone else had canceled. We were the only people on the flight. And so they said, I hope you don't mind, but because no one's going to Baghdad, we'll take you all up north where you are going, which was where we were supposed to land after going through Baghdad. No one had a problem. We gladly accepted. But again, I just think it was God saying, trust me, I will be with you. And even as we flew into that town in Erbil, which is Kurdistan, We had to do a spiral descent for possible (laughs) missiles that might be coming. But it was a a point where we learned to trust our Father in all ways and set fear aside. Here's what Dietrich Bonhoeffer says. Being a Christian is less about cautiously avoiding sin than about courageously and actively doing God's will. Sometimes we are so caught up in making sure we do all the right things and making sure that we don't sin. Maybe it's because of fear of we might get punished by God. But I think what the Father is after, what the Father desires of this church, of everyone that we know in the world, is that we courageously move out into areas to accomplish His good and perfect will in our lives. I literally have felt the pleasure of Yahweh in moments of crisis in other countries than any other place in the world. I have been on my knees in countries saying, Father, was this me? Was, how in the world are we in this situation? It, did I make a mistake? I mean, it was literally a crisis of faith going, I don't know if this is you or me. And then just to feel his pleasure coming over me and saying, you are exactly where I want you to be. And so those crises of faith for me have been incredibly important, have been incredibly encouraging. If you're not experiencing crisis of faith in your life, you might be trapped in fear. You might just be stuck, afraid of moving forward. And so I want to encourage you, if you want to feel the Father's pleasure, walk in obedience, listen to his voice, and move forward in those ways. Philip, in the New Testament, uh, extended his comfort zone. Look what it says in Acts 8, verses 4. He says, Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks and the impure impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. Now look at this last verse. It's precious. So there was great joy in that city. And so I think that's something that we need to examine as a local church, as a mobile church, as a worldwide church. Is there joy in the city because of this church? Are there thankful people in the community because what is taking place through your lives. I'm not talking about church staff. I mean, that's part of it. But it's you, the body, here in Huntington Beach. Is there joy because you're here? 
If you weren't here, would there be sorrow? I think that's where we need to examine different things and see what we have to say. There's another verse in, 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 in Acts that says, In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she began, became sick and, cried and died. And her body was washed and placed in the upstairs room. Lida was near Joppa. And when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lida, they sent two men to him and urged him, Please come at once. Next verse, please. So Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. And the widow stood around him, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. What a precious ministry. Would people cry about your death? Would they show the clothing that you had made for the poor? Would they remember you in such a precious way that their hearts were just broken and they were weeping about it? Would this community cry if this church ceased to exist? I think those are some of the things that we need to consider in our lives and we need to examine in our lives in that way to be able to see how we are impacting our, our society and how we should see every single opportunity as a chance to be light, as a chance to be salt, as a chance to, to make a difference. Like I said, I live in Chile, been there 45 years. When I go to the airport, I usually take an Uber. And it's incredible. The, I mean, I've been in Chile 45 years. I know how to talk like a Chilean. I have all the slang I have all the street language. Sometimes people look at me and go, you look like a gringo, but you sure don't sound like one. And so as I'm talking, I usually, they, either they ask me or towards the end I ask, so what do you think I do for a living? They never say pastor, ever. And when I say, oh, I'm a pastor, they go, you're the first pastor I've ever met that's like this. And I went, thank you. That's what I do on purpose. It, all these, you know, we have all these ways of saying things. We sometimes that just don't communicate the right things. And so what's incredible, the last two trips to the airport, by, at, in the parking lot at the airport, I'm able to lay hands on these drivers and pray, and they are just weeping. So I thought, man, I'm just gonna start, I'm just gonna start an Uber ministry. I'm just, I'm just gonna drive around in the car all the time and just minister to all the people that drive because you take, take care of opportunities that the Father gives you to be able to show the love of our Savior. When Jesus was questioned about why he came, in Luke 19.10, he gives his explanation, he says, for the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. That was his description of himself. Can't be any more clear than that. I came to seek and save the lost. I think that should be our goal as well. If it was our Savior's goal, it definitely should be our goal. Seek those people out. All the parables that are about the seeking of the lost. Remember the 99? He leaves them and he goes after one sheep. That's just, that's, that's a bad investment. What's going to happen with the other 99? But he loves that one so much that he risks everything to find him. And then the other one is about a woman who lo loses one coin. She literally tears the house apart. And when she finally finds it, she rejoices and calls all of her neighbors to tell about, I lost a coin and it was found. And of course, the most beautiful one is the prodigal son. This son thought he had messed up so bad 
that he would return and be a slave. And he said the father was looking out the window. And literally, in those days, when you ran, he was in robes. He literally picked up his robes and ran out to his son and kissed him and gave him a ring. This is how the father seeks the lost. This is how much he loves. And so, once again, I want to just challenge you to think about situations. Uh, uh, Because I travel a lot, I sometimes get the VIP lounge. And so my last trip back uh, from California before COVID, I was sitting in this lounge and I was very close to another uh, pair of people. And it was a mother and a daughter. And this mother was impossible. I mean impossible. The daughter literally was trying to do everything. And she was just griping. And she was just insulting. And so I kind of went up. I'm going to say something. And then I went, "Mm, I better not. (laughs) And so I sat down again. But it got worse. And I went, okay, mm, better not. (laughs) And so the third time I finally said, what can I lose? And so I got up and I walked around behind the grandmother and I said, can I talk to you for a minute? And she looked at me like, is this guy hitting on me or what, you know? And so I went, just one minute, please. And I walked away. I went, well, she follows me, great. And so she did. And, I, and she came around the corner and I said, I know this isn't my business, but I am so sorry for what you're experiencing with your mother. And she just began to cry and she fell into my arms. And I said, I, I don't want any more information than your first name. She goes, I'm going to Israel. We're going to have a rabbi on this trip. It is going to be a disaster. And I said, I will pray for you daily. And she looked up at me and she said, you are an angel. God has sent you, you know. And so I just, I just said, I just want the best for you. I am so sorry for what you're living through. And so we went back and they were called before. And as she walked out, she just said, thank you. I can, I can do this. And so these are opportunities everyone can have if you're willing to be sensitive. <laughs> it, it was a risk, obviously. But it was worth it. It was to be a blessing, and that's where we take risks as people. Right before COVID, a, we had a big event called Vive. We, we have missional events in Chile. We had several hundred young Chileans, and we were just talking about missions. My son Gabriel was here in an interview a couple months ago uh, with Scott. Uh, both my sons are very active in worship, and they did a, a time where they invited people to give their lives and go on their first mission trip. And about 100 people came forward. And so we took teams to Morocco, Sierra Leone, Thailand, and Iraq all in one year. And this is on Chilean income. We didn't ask for support from outside. And so we were able to see this difference take place. And once again, in... in, in Iraq, because I've been going since 2003, we now have two centers that were there. And we work with children in an incredible way, and we teach people how to sew. We have ballet. We have taekwondo. We have all these courses. We have the first major climbing wall in all of northern Iraq to be able to reach out to people. We've worked with refugees. ISIS attacked that part of the country. We have been working with thousands of refugees from all around the world. Right when I was ready to leave three years ago, I said to my staff, and part of our staff is Muslim, uh, I said, I'd love to do a marriage seminar sometime. And he says, can you do it before you leave? I said, I'm leaving in two days. He said, well, can you? I said, yep. And so... I ended up doing five love languages. This was radical there. It was something they had never considered. And so there was this many people at the first first event. I then came back. It grew. 
I then came back because they said, we've rented a hall for you. I said, how did you, how did you advertise it? With photocopies pasted to a wall. 300 people in this seminar. They said, we've also asked you if you could speak at a, at a college. 600 people at a college. And then I was on television in Iraq talking about the five love languages. And so this has grown. I have taught over 3,000 people. The last time I was there, I did 19 small conferences to over 1,000 people because God is opening doors. People are hungry. And let me close sharing these verses and a challenge for this precious church. Here it says in Luke 14, 12. Then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they will invite you back and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, invite the crippled, invite the lame and the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Brothers and sisters, I just challenge you today to be missional people. But to be missional people, you have to be local first. Make an impact on your family. Make an impact on your community. Come with me to Iraq. You've done it before, you'll do it again. And I just want to pray a blessing upon you. Father God, thank you for this precious body of believers. Thank you for all that they do in partnership with us. But I just pray shalom upon them. I pray goodness and that they may be people free from fear to be able to serve you in incredible ways for your glory. In the name of Yeshua. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much.